I'm Indy Nidell and this is The Great War on the Road. Today we are at the Tank Museum Bovington and we're going to talk about armored cars in the British Army during the First World War. But by we, I actually mean this guy here is going to talk about it. This is David Willey, the curator of the museum. David, say hi to everybody. Hello everyone. Now, let's just jump right in before we get specifics. Armored cars, First World War, go. So we've got, we've had armoured cars before the First World War, don't forget. Um, there was something as early as 1903, there's something called the Sims War car. The idea of putting armour plate on a vehicle is, is not new. But again, with the First World War, we're really seeing that opportunity for armoured cars to be used seriously for the first time. For the British, the story starts in early uh, in the war, before Christmas of 1914, in that period when there's a war of manoeuvre out on the Western Front, before the lines solidify. And what happens, Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, he's in charge of the British Navy, he sends out the Navy to blockade all the ports. He's then itching to get more involved in the fighting on the Western Front that's going on. So he sends out to the Flanders, Belgium basically, he sends out the Royal Naval Air Service. That's the aeroplanes that are flying for the Royal Navy. So he sends them out to France or in Belgium. He then sends out some troops, some naval troops, to protect these airfields. And don't forget, up to this point, we haven't got a static front line. There's no. still manoeuvre going on. He sent himself too, actually. He goes out as well to Antwerp, of course. So what he does is by sending out these troops, they in turn, the Royal Naval Air Service, whistle up back from the UK some vehicles to help patrol and protect the airfield. Now it just so happens one or two of these guys are fairly wealthy, um, they get the family Rolls Royce sent out to them, you're talking about guys like the Duke of Westminster etc. Now the Rolls Royce, what happens, these guys, if you see photographs of them, they're almost like an Indiana Jones figure. They've got the long Mac on, some of them have got naval beards, so they've got a nice big belt, rakish hat, cutlass in one side, pistol in the other, get in the car and let's go and have some fun. And these guys go off looking for German patrols. Now, as soon as they bump into a few Allens, there's an exchange of shots. Next moments, the guys are going back and getting their cars, put a bit of armor plate on. Oh. They go down to the naval dockyard. They get the Navy there, down there as a, and the Belgium ship workers to put some armor plate on some of these vehicles. A Couple of weeks later, they're adding a machine gun. And these guys are going off having fun. Now, Churchill sees that potential of the armoured motorised vehicle right. when he's helping to think forward in a short time about the tank. But those armoured vehicles, early in the war, very improvised designs, they, as soon as the front line becomes static, in other words, the Germans start digging trenches, for a wheeled vehicle, you need a road. Right. They are pretty useless cross-country. Um, at the same time, the British now, we're actually looking at uh, not just getting improvised Rolls Royces, we actually get the Rolls Royce company, we get the Silver Ghost vehicle, and we have a formalised pattern to armour plate it. So they start making these in production numbers. They don't get out to France and Belgium in time to really make a bit of a difference early in the war, but they then send that unit out to Gallipoli, and armoured cars are actually used in some of the far-flung battles of empire. They go to Africa, um, they go to the Middle East, um, some are taken out, we actually supply some to the Russians as well. So armoured cars see peripheral action. Right. In the open front. In the opening bit as well, and it can't, they can't really engage successfully on the Western Front till manoeuvre comes back in the battles in 1918. And then we see the armoured car yet again take a role during the exploitation phases at things like the Battle of Amiens, they can go racing ahead up perfectly paved roads still Machine because they've got through. Yeah. Again, this one, this is our Rolls Royce. This is actually a post-war. This is called the 1921 pattern, very similar to the First World War ones. The armoured body, Silver Ghost Rolls Royce engine under there, Vickers machine gun in the turret, sometimes two or a three-man crew. And uh, it's also what you have to say, it's such a stylish looking vehicle. Yeah. And this particular That's Rolls cool. Royce went into service with the British Army just after the First World War, saw service in the Far East, went to Shanghai, and this was still serving the British Army at the beginning of World War II, doing airfield defence and coastal protection. Now, how, how, what could this armour handle? Um, you're looking at here, you can actually see it again, it's a standard sort of um, First World War, just 0.47 of an inch, 1.2 centimetres. It'll stop bullets yet again. Um, they have a problem, of course, with armoured cars generally, because as soon as you get a tyre punctured, yeah. 
they start introducing run flat tyres so you can still actually proceed even though you've lost most of the air out of the tyre. But the real problem of a vehicle like this, and you can see it, even though they've strengthened the axles, they've got a fairly long wheelbase, as soon as you leave a road, you're in a bit of trouble. In real trouble. Um, and again, if you only have to think of the Western Front, boggy ground, shelter strewn ground, etc., cetera, uh, churned up, you're gonna have uh, an awful lot of trouble trying to get a, the mobility that something like a Rolls Royce well, is great advantage, which is why you go for a track vehicle, which has got that capacity to cross rougher ground. Now, um, maybe people up there don't know, cars back then, how fast could this thing go on a decent road? Um, this is actually quite a speedy vehicle. You know, we've, we've taken this vehicle out. This one still drives. Um, it's, it's used for parades. Uh, off record, the guys have got it up to about 45 miles an hour on the open road. Okay. Now, that's a lot of speed for this type of level of armor plate that's on there. Yeah. The problem you've got is, of course, speed's not your real issue, it's stopping. Um, so if we get too fast, trying to slow this damn thing down, you've got to go oh, through the brakes. The, the weight. It's sheer weight. That's another thing that, that, that people tend to forget about. So mobility, just being able to get around that much quicker. Um, and again, they're looking in 1918, how can we use armoured cars with cavalry, other armoured vehicles? Again, in 1918, we're seeing this, this clever use of the latest technology. How can we tactically use it? Let the tanks make a hole let those armoured cars go ahead and do the damage, cause mayhem behind the lines. You can actually take, pull a lever inside and it takes the exhaust away from the engine. So the idea is if you're in a colonial or policing situation, yeah. if all the locals are getting a wee bit too close or a little bit too uppity for what you like, you pull the lever, this roar comes out the engine and everyone backs off. Oh, right. So it's a simple way, again, non-lethal non weapon you system sort of thing. Definitely. Oh, you got that. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, okay, well, okay, let's have we a, see if we can have a look in the back. So, um, see? do you want to be the young and fit one? Um, not in these pants, as I discovered <laughs> on, the, uh, on the Mark I that I can't So, climb do you want to come pants. around and have a nose in through the back here and we can describe what you're looking at? So, if you want to, uh, to peep through there. So, obviously, you can see there, the right-hand side is a driver. And even though he's got a back to his seat, he's actually pretty much sitting on the floor. Okay. And at the moment, ahead of him, his visor, there's a lever on the dashboard. You pull the visor and that lever drops down. Um, there's a starting handle, steering controls, gear levers on the actual um, steering wheel. You can see through there. And above him would be the commander who operates also the Vickers machine gun. He's got a hatch in the top, different models, slightly different shaped turrets. Um, but really what you're looking at here for the British after the First World War, fantastic for policing empire. Yeah. During the First World War, it tends to only see action in those um, battles or the campaigns on the periphery of empire um, rather than on that Western Front. Well, we do see, we saw plenty of armored car action on the Eastern Front with uh, the Belgians and the Russians and Germans. And if you're wondering why we're not talking about that today, it's that because that's going to be covered in episodes of its own later on. Now, what's in here that's padlocked? So what you've got, you've got lockers here for taking tools and other bits of equipment. And down the sides on the running boards, they'd actually take unditching beams along with them as well. The whole point of those beams is you can lay them over particularly softer ground to be able to travel over the top and be able to continue right. forward. Um, but you can see it's a, it's a stylish looking vehicle, so there's anything to do with Rolls Royce. Um, and, and also just the fact they particularly chose a Rolls Royce car That's because cool. of its reliability, that power the engine's got, very smooth ride. They strengthen the suspension, given an extra wheel at the back uh, for the armoured car version. But um, it's, it's a stunningly effective vehicle and so well made, they were going on to the beginning of the Second World War, those, those early... 1920s versions so you know a cracking bit of design all right well there you have it the rolls-royce armored car and the british armored cars in general during the first world war well david thank you very much thanks sir. okay um if you'd like to see our episode about how when winston churchill actually did go to belgium in the early stages of the war you can click right here for that do not forget to subscribe and check us out on our subreddit out because it's got all kinds of cool stuff and flow scream something so they know you're here Hi. And there's Flo. See you next time.